Howdy, and welcome back to the second part of making a tower defense game with Bevy. In this episode, we'll add a powerful debugging utility, create our own components, query for entities, learn how to use timers, and load a model from Blender. So let's jump right on in. The debugging utility I love to use in every Bevy project is the eGUI Inspector. This is a very powerful tool with tons of options for customization, and I plan on making a showcase for it in the near future. I recommend looking at their examples page to see all of the ways you can create custom inspectors, but for now, we're just going to use the default world inspector. To use this, first we need to add the dependency to our cargo toml. Then we add the using statement to main and add the world inspector plugin. Now when we run the game, we see a window in the top left that shows us every entity currently in the game. We can click through these to see the different components on each entity and even change their values. For example, we can now play with the standard material properties live in-game. One resource to look into is the World Inspector params. This lets you do many things like disabling the window or allowing you to despawn entities live. Often, for bigger projects, I'll set the inspector up on a toggle key. Now one thing I like to do is give every entity I spawn a name. This doesn't really change anything in game, but it makes the inspector show the entity name instead of just a number. Also, as some cleanup, let's add a point light exactly like the 3D scene example does. This will make things in the game easier to see. All we need is the point light bundle, which has the point light, the transforms, the visibilities, and some internal components that we'll leave as the default. For the point light, I'm just going to use the exact values from the example, but you can play with it live in-game to find something that looks better if you want. Now let's make our first component. We want our cube to be a tower that shoots periodically. So the first component will be a strut called tower. Like I said last time, components can be struts or enums and are the actual data associated with our entities. To make this strut a component, we just need to add a derived component statement and it's ready to go. Now we can insert it into our cube, and when we run the game, we see the component in the inspector. Sometimes it's nice to have components without any data, just to mark an entity as being a tower, and I call those marker components. Here, however, we do want some data on the tower component, because we want to shoot a bullet every second or so. We could write our own timer, but thankfully Bevy provides one that we can easily use, so let's add a shooting timer member of type timer to our strut. Now, when we insert our component, we need to initialize the timer. I prefer to use from seconds, which takes the time the timer takes, and a flag for if it should repeat. We want this timer to take one second and to repeat. Now, we're ready to create a system to tick the timer and spawn our bullets. Let's create a new function called tower shooting, and here we need commands to spawn the bullet, the mesh and material assets so we can create a PBR bundle like last time, and we need a query for our towers. Queries are a core system program in Bevy, and they have tons of flexibility that we'll use in this series. For now, we're going to create the simplest possible query, where we just get mutable access to our tower components. This query will get all of the tower components in the game in an iterator, and let us mutate them. We could also get immutable access by just using an ampersand in the component name. It's important to remember to only use ampersand component or ampersand mute component in your queries or otherwise Bevy will give you another horrible error message. Forgetting the ampersand is a common typo for me and it's worth double checking. Also make sure that you've derived component for anything you're querying. Now in the system, we can iterate over all of the tower components and tick the timer. To actually tick the timer though, we need one more resource from Bevy, the time resource. This is what you want to use for all the timekeeping in your game and it'll give you the delta between frames. This should be familiar to how you handle time in other game engines like Unity. So let's tick the timer with the time delta. Now we can check if the timer just finished, and if it did, then we want to spawn our bullet. We can follow the same steps we did last episode to create a tiny cube near the tower. Let's remember to add this system to our app so it runs every frame, and now we see our bullet spawning in once per second. If we look in the inspector though, we cannot look into our custom component and it has a nice error message telling us what we need to do. Let's go back to the code and add the reflect and default derives and mark the component with reflect component. Then in main, we can register our component type with the app. 
Now in the inspector, we can look at the nice view into the timer and see it ticking and finishing every second, and even tweak it live. If we left this to run though, eventually we would spawn infinite bullets and the game would crash. So let's create another component to despawn old bullets. I'm going to create a component called lifetime, and just like tower, it only needs a timer. You might be tempted to only have one component because these have the same data, but these timers mean different things and will want to do different actions when they finish. Don't be afraid to create more components if you need conceptually different behavior for different entities. Now when we spawn the bullet, let's add the lifetime component and give it a half second lifetime so we can see it working. Next we'll want to create a new system called bullet despawn. Here we want commands to despawn the entity, the time to tick our timer, and we want to query for our lifetimes. Now we can iterate over the lifetimes, tick their timers, and when they finish we can use commands to despawn the entity. Unfortunately, we've hit a problem. We don't know which entity to despawn because the component doesn't track which entity it belongs to. To fix this, we need to add entity to our query. There's a couple of things to note here. If we want to query for multiple components, we can use a tuple as the query parameter, and then when we iterate, we'll get that tuple of data. This will only get entities that have all of the components in the query, so it allows you to be granular with your queries. You can even mix and match mutable access. Just remember the tuple parens, or you'll run into more compiler errors. There is one magic thing we can query for, and that is entity. This is the only query parameter that you don't need ampersand for, and when you query for this, you'll get the entity associated with the components. I almost only use this along with commands to modify or despawn an entity, and remember that the entity type is just an ID number. So now in our system, we want to query for the entity ID and mutable access to the lifetime component. When we want to despawn bullets, we use commands.entity and give it our entity ID. This lets us modify this specific entity. Here, we want to despawn the entity, and I recommend always using despawn recursive. We haven't run into it yet, but Bevy allows entities to be children of each other, and despawn recursive will also despawn all of the children of an entity, which is almost always what I want when I despawn something. Remember to add this as a system, and now in game we see bullets appearing and despawning. This is still quite a ways to go for a tower defense game, but we're starting to pick up some speed. I hope at this point you're getting pretty comfortable with making systems and are starting to see how things can click together. As our last touch for this video, let's actually load in a bullet model from Blender. I've created this nice looking tomato as our bullet for this game. Don't judge, I'm not a 3D artist. This model has three different PBR materials though, and they use things like roughness and specular, so it should show off the standard material pretty well. All we need to do is export this as a GLB file, and when exporting in Blender, I just check to include everything. Bevy only officially supports GLTF files and their binary copy GLB. Also, make sure to remove the lights and camera from your scene, because the GLB file will load these into Bevy. Actually, if you want, you can use these to set up lighting in a camera instead of spawning them in with code, and Bevy will interpret their settings in-game. It's an interesting workflow, but it's not one that I use personally. One final thing I like to do is to import the GLB back into Blender to make sure it exported everything right. I highly recommend testing the file this way before you blame Bevy or your code for an asset not loading correctly. Now over in Bevy, we need to load the file in. I'm going to create a new system called Asset Loading, where I want commands and a new resource called the Asset Server. This handles loading in assets from the file system and allows you to asynchronously load in assets. The Asset Server expects all assets to be in a folder called Assets, so let's create that and add our GLB file to it. I'm also keeping my raw blend files here so you guys can see it and modify it. Now, when we call assets.load, we give it the file path relative to assets. This works as is for things like audio and images, but GLB files are a bit unique and we want to add a pound scene zero after the path. This is because GLB files can hold many different assets and Biffy lets us specify what we want to load. Scene zero for us is the entire file. If you want to learn more about this, then the cheat book has an amazing chapter detailing out all the different ways to deal with complex GLB files and the different attributes you can add here. Calling load on the asset server gets you back a handle, but the asset might not be loaded yet. Bevy gracefully handles this, but you may see models popping in as they load. You can check the load status of any handle with the asset manager, or you can use a community plugin like Bevy Asset Loading to only run the game once every asset is loaded.
For us, we'll just carry on as if the asset is loaded and deal with the pop-in. One final note is this is an important time to check that you're using the engine code optimization trick, because that will greatly decrease model load times. I'm going to stick this handle into a resource called Game Assets and insert that into our game with commands. The handle type is seen because that's what we're loading from the GLB. Now, the tower shooting system just needs the Game Assets resource instead of meshes and materials. Instead of spawning a PBR bundle, we're going to spawn a scene bundle. Scenes can be very complex and like I mentioned can include things like lights, cameras, and all kinds of things. But here our scene is just a tomato model. When we run the game, we see our tomato is now loaded into the game and it looks great to me. If we look at the bullet in the inspector, we see a complex hierarchy has been created, and the mesh has been broken up into multiple entities with different materials. This is how we're working around the one material component per entity problem. This also justifies our use of despawn recursive because we want to get rid of all of these mesh entities when we despawn the bullet parent. In the future, we'll make our own hierarchies and discuss how things like transforms propagate, but for now we can just enjoy the magic in our beautiful tomatoes. This is where we'll wrap up for this video, but we've covered a lot of important topics this time. Feel free to play around with creating different components and queries. Get some practice learning how to spot common error messages and their fixes, because this takes a bit of muscle memory to get comfortable with. I hope if you're following along in 2D, you're able to modify these concepts easily to fit your own game. Next time, we'll get the tomato moving and we'll get input from the player. If you're watching the week this releases, then I recommend giving the Bevy Game Jam coming up a try. It's a week long, and if you join my Discord server, I would be glad to help you with any problems you have. Just remember to keep your scope and goals small, and have a great time learning Bevy. As always, thank you so much to my wonderful Patreons. I really appreciate the support, and it means the world to me. Please remember to like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.